your moderator for this afternoon's plenary, Chief Executive Officer of the Boston Globe, Linda Henry. Hello, it is so wonderful to be here together at this incredible conference, Solve at MIT. I am honored to be your moderator for the opening plenary conversations. This gathering, as you know, is really, really special and just endlessly inspiring, as you've already heard and with the guests that we have coming up to talk today. I have been a witness to this dream of Solve since its very, very early days when the idea of this almost Davos on the Charles was a twinkle in President Rife's eyes. It's a, this gathering to actually solve some of our greatest challenges. President Reif and the talented team here had been to plenty of conferences and this bold idea to not just talk about what needs to be done and the way things are, but to serve as a catalytic convener to bring the resources, the research, the focus, and the smartest people out there who care to change our future. I am incredibly proud that this conference is here in Cambridge as well, where thanks to the world-class educational and medical institutions, this region has a long time, a long history of tackling some of the hardest problems out there, the success of which has done nothing less than change the world. This conference understands that this wave of real disruption, of really solving some of these problems, is not just what technology can do, but real change is at the intersection of art, science, and technology. The fantastic lineup today reflects that, combined with a critical appreciation of humanity. So now, I am delighted to introduce our first conversation, starting off with an exceptionally exciting guest, Dr. Shirin Ibadi, the founder of Defenders of Human Rights Center, based in Iran and winner of the 2003 Nobel Peace Prize for her tireless work on human rights and democracy. She will be joining us from London and speaking in Farsi. We'll be accompanied by her translator, Shirin Ershadi, who is based in California. So to aid in the translation, I will fit the conversation into three questions and give more space for her to speak without interruptions. So. Please welcome Dr. Abadi. Hello, how are you? Good day to all of you and all of the people who can hear me today. Wonderful. Dr. Abadi, you've been a leading voice in international human rights, women and girls advocacy, and democracy for decades. Thinking about the challenges before us where ethical innovation would make a difference, can you share with us where you see the greatest needs for action? Today's world sees a lot of challenges. For example, the global warming, all of the wars that are going on in different parts of the world. Mm, we see scarcity of food, expansion of poverty, and I'm very sorry that we have not been able to find a solution because our challenges have become more and more. For example, uh, when we look at the Second World War, when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was being uh, written, the issue of global warming or access to the internet or the environment were not uh, regarded because they were not issues there. And this example will tell us that our challenges uh, are being grown and continued. Now, I just want to tell you a challenge that I think is the infrastructure, and that is the sliding of democracy, and the fact that people's role and importance 
is not being regarded. This is happening in different countries. We can see it in Europe, for example. We see that the right is taking over and populism taking over. Uh, for example, if you think about 20 years ago, I don't think the people of France would think that someone like Marine Le Pen uh, um, get all these votes. Or after the collapse of the USSR, we can see that in a, a little while, someone like Putin takes over who is being a key KGB member. And how he really suppresses all of the people who criticize him. And look at what he's done in Ukraine. He has attacked Ukraine now. So there are all these challenges. But I'm not going to give you more examples because I don't have that much time. But I want to see what is the source of all of this. Why is it that democracy is sliding back? I think that the most important issue is us citizens. Meaning that we have not been able to support democracy. Um, I want to give you an example. I want to compare it to a nice flower pot that you have at home. For example, you have to put it in the correct light, you have to water it um, every day. But if you forget about it for a full month, it will die, I mean, the flower will die. The same thing is about, uh, true about democracy. So our only duty as citizens is not to pay taxes or just go to the ballot box. We have to control and hold accountable the people that we have elected. They have to respond to us and we have to supervise them so that they cannot abuse the power that people have invested in them. So, and if we neglect that, if we don't supervise them, if we don't hold accountable people that we have elected, democracy is gonna slide. And in such slide, we will witness more challenges and different challenges. That is an excellent point about um, democracy and the need for nurturing and tending of democracy that we need to do. So thinking specifically about the lessons you've learned from your work in Iran and at the Defender of Human Rights Center, what can you share about the challenges of countering authoritarian governance grounded in notions of populism? So, please first let me give you a, my definition of democracy. In the 20th century, we always thought that we're, it's like uh, the support of the people, the will of the people, and elections uh, that uh, is called democracy. But let's not forget that Hitler and Khomeini in Iran and Bashar, Bashar Assad in Syria, Putin in Russia, they have all been elected by the people. So, um, an individual or the party that has uh, been elected does not have the right to rule as they like, and they don't have the right to abuse their power. There is a standard for democracy, and I think that the party or the winner of the elections has to observe that uh, standard, and that is human rights, the standards of human rights. What I want to say is that the governments do not get their legitimacy from the uh, ballot box, but the ballot box and respect for human rights. Uh, but now, I just want to uh, tell you about my country, Iran, after I've given you the definition for democracy. In 1979, there was a revolution in Iran, and over 90% of the people voted for the Islamic Republic. 
Unfortunately, as a result of such election, we got a religious dictatorship. And uh, this government thinks that they are the guardian of people in this world, and also they want to bring everyone to heaven. And they don't give them the right not to go to heaven. And so, on the basis of the laws that they have all approved, uh, like the consumption of alcohol or even trading alcohol, has a, a punishment of 80 lashes of flogging. Abortion is not only ba banned, but even contraceptives and condoms are prohibited in Iran. And sexual relations outside of a marriage is a crime. And the punishment begins from a hundred lashes, and sometimes it gets up to stoning people. Homosexuality is a crime in Iran, and uh, it bears heavy punishments. And pursuant to the law in Iran, the life of a woman is worth half of that of a man. Meaning, if me and my brother, we go um, on the street and we are attacked, they're saying the compensation paid to my brother is twice as much the compensation paid to me. And pursuant to the Constitution of the Islamic Republic of Iran and other laws in Iran, are based on the basis of discrimination, as on the basis of gender, uh, ethnicity, and religion. And that has caused dissatisfaction. And these are Stone Age laws. And we see the expansion of poverty as well. And that results in dissatisfaction of people too. Iran is a very wealthy country, but Half, more than half of the people live under the line of poverty. Uh, there are three issues uh, that result in the expansion of poverty. First is the embezzlement of the government and the cronies of the government. Secondly, it is the politics, it's the policies of the Islamic Republic of Iran because at the beginning of the revolution, uh, Iran decided to intervene in uh, other countries' affairs and spent a lot of money, uh, the money that has to go to schools, to hospitals, but they're sent to the Hezbollah in Lebanon, to uh, the Houthis in Yemen, and the militia in other countries. and. Of course, the uh, third issue is the economic sanctions in Iran. And this has happened because of the enrichment of uranium uh, without observing the supervision of the IAEA. And since the government of Iran interferes in the affairs of its neighbors, it has been isolated. So it's only Russia and China who strategically support Iran, and that's because of all the uh, profits that they make out of this and support Iran. So uh, even when uh, Ukraine was attacked, Iran took the part of Russia and is broadcasting the propaganda of the Putin regime in Iran. And so when the people of Iran who wanted to support the Ukrainian people uh, went to, to the streets, they were attacked by the police, and they, some of them were apprehended. The people of Iran uh, take to the streets peacefully, and uh, they uh, bring their opposition through the civil society. And they uh, go to the streets to rallies and uh, bring their opposition to the world. One of these groups are the teachers. These teachers uh, close schools one day per month 
and they bring their opposition to the streets. Also, it's the laborers, it's the students, it's the women. They all state their opposition to the government and their dissatisfaction of this. And although these statistics are informal, but at this time we have a thousand political prisoners and prisoners of conscience in Iraq. Under these conditions, my colleagues and myself have become the voice of the people of Iran and the challenges they face. And I want to bring the voice of the people of Iran who want a democratic and secular government in Iran. I have used my Nobel Prize money to buy a condominium uh, for uh, to make an NGO for the human rights in Iran. However, all of the uh, property that I had was confiscated, uh, even my personal uh, property and the NGO, but they cannot confiscate my tongue and they cannot confiscate my pen. And so up to now, I have been able to bring the voice of people to get to democracy. Dr. Abadabi, thank you so much for sharing your journey and the incredible work that you're doing to fight for human rights and um, the lesson and perspective that you shared today. So thank you very much for your time.